It says, Ivo Fechter is an independent journalist whose flagship column appears weekly in Daily Maverick. And if you haven't read it yet, please do yourself a favor and make sure you watch out for it. He started out as a technology journalist in 1993 and now writes, uh, writes on a wide range of economic, political, technology and environmental subjects. And he has written a book on environmental subjects. And he says he is writing one on economics or is going to start writing one on economics. <laughs> From the perspective of individual liberty and free markets. And that is something that Ivo does very well. And that is to prom promote liberty and free markets. Over to you, Ivo. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You know, the reason why my bio is only five lungs long is because I'm not qualified in anything. You know, they say if you, if you can't do, you teach. If you can't teach, you write about it. Um, I'd like to thank the Free Market Foundation for inviting me here. Um, it's a great honor to be talking to you. It's nice to see a good turnout. Um, I want to talk, I'm not going to keep you too long. Uh, I want to talk about the data must fall movement which I'm sure all of you will have seen on uh, the internet in various guises. Um, and my point really will be that data won't fall and it shouldn't be made to. Inexpensive, ubiquitous and fast internet connectivity always seems to be in the future in South Africa. Well, that's what you would believe if you listen to early adopters, tech heads, entrepreneurs and media savvy people like me. As demanding customers always do, we complain that we want faster data at lower prices, and we want it yesterday. And this is the sentiment behind the data must fall movement, which is agitating for lower mobile and fixed line data prices. But that raises the question, is this complaint valid? Right? And even if it is valid, would government regulation be an appropriate response? Now, if you cast your mind back during the negotiations for a new dispensation in South Africa, it was recognized very early on that telecommunications policy would be of major importance to a developing economy. Even before the 1994 election, several models were considered, uh, but it was soon abundantly clear that the government was intent on maintaining a tight grip on what it saw as a strategic sector of the economy. The only gesture towards market liberalization was to issue two licenses for the emerging technology of mobile telephones. They were issued in 1993, to companies you may have heard of, Vodacom and MTN. The premise was that cell phones were toys for the rich and the profit motive would result in limited market penetration of perhaps a million or so people. Shows you what central planners know. <laughs> Fixed line telephony, by contrast, was considered the infrastructure backbone on which to build access for the poor and the previously disadvantaged. It was reserved for Telcom, which enjoyed a state-guaranteed monopoly from 1997 until 2002. And this experiment was a disaster. A 30% stake in Telcom was sold to Thintana, which is a so-called strategic equity partner, uh, a consortium led by SBC Communications of Texas. And that company specializes in exploiting telecoms networks in developing countries. Now, there was a clause in its shareholder agreement which was kept secret at the time. I remember we fought long and hard to get that shareholder agreement, uh, agreement made public. It was kept secret, and what it turned out to do was it explicitly exempted both Telcom and Centana from clauses in the New Telecommunications Act of 1997. And this permitted SBC to underinvest in infrastructure and milk Telcom for all the profit that its monopoly was worth. Now, the nominal quid pro quo for these extraordinarily monopoly rights was that Telcom had to install a paltry million lines into underserviced areas, which of course it did. Right? The number of fixed lines peaked in the year 2000 at about five and a half million. However, as soon as its legal obligation was discharged, Telcom disconnected many of these new lines for non-payment. 
Today, there are only 3.4 million fixed lines left, which is the lowest total since 1992. And although fixed lines remain superior for internet access in terms of both speed and price, their, numbers continues to, their number continues to drop by about 200,000 per year. Shows you what central planners know. Now, some subscribers preferred mobile phones because of convenience, but most chose to switch because you had to be creditworthy to get a fixed telecom line. Profit-driven mobile operators had pioneered prepaid contracts to overcome this problem. Combined with heavy competition in the handset market, which drove down prices, the poor, which hitherto had been forced to use public telephones, were soon talking, uh, taking to cell phones in their droves. And the uptake among consumers surprised even the mobile operators themselves. By the year 2000, there were 8 million mobile subscribers. By 2010, after a third mobile operator had been licensed, there were 50 million. Today, there are over 80 million. And the vast majority of South Africans now have access to mobile telephony. At about 150 SIM cards per, thousand, uh, per 100 citizens, so that's about 150%, cell phone penetration in South Africa is among the highest in the world. Shows you what central planners know. Now, the foundation of the success lay in privately owned radio spectrum. Right? Because it is a limited resource, the market ensured that the best qualified operators with the deepest pockets got to own it. And this created an incentive to invest billions of rands in infrastructure and to develop and introduce new technologies that made more efficient use of the spectrum. The spectacular success of private mobile telephony did not translate as well to internet connectivity, however in part because the internet really required fixed lines, and in part because a limited number of operator licenses also limited the vigor of competition among them. More often than not, they'd compete on branding and marketing, rather than quality on price. And the result was a slow decline by global standards. When our policy framework was being established 20 years ago, as the dot-com boom was beginning to take off, South Africa was the 27th most connected country in the world which for our size was pretty impressive. Internet penetration at the time was led by academia, as well as private businesses and wealthy households, uh, predominantly relying on fixed lines. But since then, South Africa has steadily dropped in the world rankings. Today, it is only 90th on the list of most connected countries, with fewer than half of the population having access to the Internet, despite having access to mobile phones in many cases. Now, the government keeps saying it will roll out national broadband data access. It has been saying this for 15 years. Despite billions of rand in investment, there are still no signs that these efforts are likely to bear fruit. And to anyone who has followed the fortunes of telecommunication policy, or indeed of state-controlled enterprises of any kind, this will come as no surprise. Over budget, under delivery is the hallmark of enterprises owned, controlled, or driven by government. Second and third national operators were supposed to be licensed once Telcom monopoly period expired in 2002 uh, in the hope of creating competition in the fixed line market. Well, the idea of a third operator was ditched very early on, and the second operator, Neotel, didn't get off the ground until four years later, 2006. And although handpicked for this purpose, it failed to spur much competition and made almost no impact at customer level. In the 10 years since its establishment, it petered out into the disappointment of a failed acquisition bid by Vodacom for the paltry sum of 7 billion rand, which is equivalent to just over a month's worth of the mobile operator's revenue. And in June 2016, it was announced that Liquid Telecom, a subsidiary of the Zimbabwean company Econet Wireless, bought Neotel for a mere 6 billion rand. When Neotel entered the market in 2006, it had to build infrastructure from scratch. Now, this was widely seen as an obstacle to competition. So, in 2007, a government committee recommended that the local loop be unbundled. Now, the local loop is the cable that connects customer premises to local exchanges. And it was thought to be the most difficult and expensive segment of network infrastructure to duplicate. Local loop unbundling would give new market entrants the ability to use copper laid by telecom 
without having to worry that Telkom would interfere with its access to customers. Now, the deadline for this process was 2011. It never happened. And Telkom continues to resist the effort to unbundle the local loop to this day. Now, if you think about it from a shareholder's point of view, of course, Telkom's resistance, resistance is entirely legitimate. After all, it isn't like Telkom is wholly government owned anymore. Right? A part of Telkom was listed on the stock exchange, and the local loop was among the assets that were sold to investors. So expropriating it would unjustly harm investors who bought these shares in good faith. Ironically, however, the failure to unbundle the local loop has been a blessing in disguise for South African consumers. Because competitors struggled to get access to customer premises, they began to lay their own infrastructure. The deployment of things like fiber to the curb, fiber to the home in urban residential areas, and the rollout of 4G mobile services would have been much less enthusiastic if Telcom's local loop assets had been nationalized as intended. Just as with mobile spectrum, private ownership of fixed line infrastructure is what ultimately spurred investment and improved services. Still, there are speed bumps on the road to improved data offerings in South Africa, especially for mobile applications. In the US, which has never been in the vanguard of telecommunications progress, the regulator last year declared broadband to constitute a minimum speed of 25 megabits per second. Right? In South Africa, this would be a super fast product affordable only to wealthy urban consumers and businesses. I cannot get more than 4 megabits per second where I live. Over in the States, a premium consumer product would be in the gigabit range, right? 10 times as fast as the best product that ordinary South Africans can enjoy. In the US, consumers and producers of high bandwidth services are rebelling against data caps, a practice that is newly imposed by operators who enjoy regional monopolies or duopolies. In South Africa, data caps have always been standard practice, right? and uncapped services are not only expensive, but are routinely throttled or deprioritized, resulting in sluggish performance well below advertised standards. Because consumers have little choice in South Africa, operators pitch new technologies such as fiber at prices that are benchmarked to the technologies that they are meant to replace. So as a result, many of the advantages of the new technology, faster speeds at lower prices, go to operators, while consumers enjoy only the crumbs of slow, incremental improvements in data speed or price. As the focus of telecommunications moves to data, Network operators also increasingly rely on data sales to make up for declining voice revenues. Meanwhile, they fight tooth and nail against so-called over-the-top services, which is a sort of nonsensical term to describe things like texting and calling that used to be carried out on voice networks. So for wealthy consumers who compare and contrast with the best that foreign countries can offer, yeah, South Africa's data offerings seem parsimonious, unreliable and expensive. So much so that this process movement has arisen among people with leisure to take to social media for this purpose under the catchy hashtag, hashtag data must fall. Premised on the notion that South Africans pay too much for access to secondary data networks, it is demanding that government act to reduce prices. Whenever you hear someone demand that government act to reduce prices, be very, very afraid. But first it raises the question whether data really is that much more expensive than elsewhere in the world. Right? And as it turns out, this is actually a very complex question to answer. Voice and data products are very hard to compare across different, operating, uh, uh, across different operators and countries. They come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes, so there's no one-to-one -one comparison. On a pure price basis, South Africa actually compares fairly well with other countries. At the high end of the mobile market, South Africans pay about 30 rand per gigabyte from Telcom, and 50 rand per gigabyte from mobile operators. That's less than Australians and Americans pay, according to research conducted by my broadband. And New Zealanders pay about two and a half times as much as we do. India comes in slightly cheaper at 26 rand 30, just below our 30 rand, while the UK is much cheaper at only 8 rand 38 per gigabyte. At the lower end of the market, India remains a little cheaper but Australians, Britons, and Americans all pay about twice as much as South Africans do. New Zealanders pay almost four times as much. 
So at the low end of the market, our price is actually fairly good. If you adjust for income levels, because of course New Zealanders are considerably richer than South Africans, we spend about 2.3% of our income on information and communication technology on average. According to the latest figures from 2014, uh, compiled by the International Telecommunications Union. And if you want to look up this report, uh, if you like very lengthy tables, uh, and lots of them, uh, I can highly recommend the 2015 Measuring the Information Society report, which has a lot of details about international comparisons on cost for data and uh, Envoy services. This costs 2.3% of our share of, uh, of uh, as a share of our income. It's the lowest in Africa, and is almost a full percentage point less than it was just a year earlier. Right? We do pay more than most rich countries pay as a share of our income, but that appears to be more a function of lower income than it is to blame on more expensive communication. Out of 170 countries ranked by the ITU, South Africa ranks slap bang in the middle in terms of telecommunications costs as a share of income at 80th. This does put us behind Brazil and China. We're roughly on a par with Chile, Hungary and Mexico. And we're well ahead of India. South Africa also enjoys an ICT development index, which exceeds the average for developing countries and far exceeds the average for Africa. Now, I drew the distinction earlier between mobile and mobile uh, data or mobile operators and fixed lines. And it's very interesting to look at the rankings if you split these telecommunications costs between mobile and fixed lines. South Africa ranks 120th in the world in fixed line telephone costs, right, thanks to our government's experiment with monopolizing fixed line infrastructure. And we ranked 72nd in mobile cellular costs thanks to private mobile operators. In fixed broadband prices, as a share of income, we also rank worse than in any category of mobile broadband when compared to the rest of the world. Right? So the affordability of the fixed line data and fixed line voice services right, is much less for South Africans than mobile. Now, Africa's low income levels obviously complicate the ITU's attempt to provide price comparisons. Now, after all, the cost of infrastructure has very little to do with per capita income. On a dollar basis, Africa's mobile cellular rates compare favorably with those of the Asia-Pacific region, while Americans pay more and Europeans pay almost twice as much. A pure price comparison is complicated by many other factors. One is the value of the domestic currency, which has dropped precipitously in the last few years. And almost all telecommunications equipment, including handsets, are originally priced in US dollars. Another complication is the long distances between South Africa and the rest of the world, right, which is where most of the internet is located. We are dependent on a handful of undersea cables that span long distances, mostly to the Northern Hemisphere. Access to these cables is again priced in dollars. Yet another factor to consider is the size of South Africa relative to its population. Outside of the main metropolitan areas, our population density is extremely low, right, which makes infra internet infrastructure relatively more expensive per capita. And then there's the fact that the last 20 or so years worth of infrastructure build started with a huge backlog, thanks to apartheid era underinvested and mo underinvestment aimed mostly at rich white South Africans and businesses. So all these factors to, to my mind, weigh heavily against the view that data prices must necessarily fall. I mean, I'm no more a fan of the telecom cartel than your average customer, and I'd like lower prices just as much as the next guy. Uh, but it is far, clear, far from clear that South Africa's prices are extraordinarily high. What is abundantly clear, however, is that private ownership of radio spectrum has been extraordinarily successful at placing phones into the hands of millions of people. Uh, including the poor, while government control of the fixed lines has proven to be an extraordinary, fa uh, extraordinary failure, with fewer lines in operation than at any time since South Africa's transition to democracy. Now, operators argue that a lack of available spectrum is hampering improvements in mobile data offerings, and this is somewhat true. 
To improve data speeds and prices without more spectrum would require costly investment in base stations. This is why profit margins on data are expected to decline sharply over the next five years in continuation of a long-term trend of higher data throughput at lower unit prices. Now, additional spectrum would certainly improve circumstances for mobile operators. And conveniently, a great swath of spectrum currently dedicated to analog television broadcasts was supposed to have been released to the market with the transition to digital terrestrial television. Not unexpectedly, however, this process, like most initiatives driven by government, has been delayed by many years. Still, some spectrum was due to be auctioned next year, despite all these delays. I didn't think that it would arrive on time, uh, even on the delayed, by the delayed deadline of September next year. But now it looks like it won't arrive at all, because the minister himself, Siabonga Kwele, intervened. At the end of September, he won a court application to halt the auction of all of the spectrum by the regulator ICASA. The minister argued that the regulator ought to wait for the publication of the integrated ICT policy white paper. And ironically, the court order was granted the day after Cabinet approved that policy document for the discussion. Now, I believe that Duncan McLeod is joining us here at the Free Market Foundation uh, in January to talk in a lot more detail about ICT policy and what is in that white paper. So I'm certainly looking forward to that. What I did pick up from it, though, is that it turned everything on its head and threatens to undo the very foundation of the successes achieved in South Africa by the private operators. Because Spectrum is a limited resource, the market ensured that the best qualified, opera best qualified operators with the biggest resources got to own it, which created an incentive to invest tens of billions in infrastructure and to introduce technologies that made more efficient use of the Spectrum. This year alone, the largest two mobile operators have plans to spend 20 billion rand on their networks. Now it appears that government got jealous of the market's success. And instead of relinquishing state-owned spectrum dedicated to outdated broadcasting technology so that it can be used more efficiently for data by private operators, the white paper stunned the market by proposing to nationalize privately owned spectrum. This would enable the minister to, to, to dole it out to favored cronies on some undisclosed basis that presumably is not willingness to pay. Nationalization will likely extend to expropriating spectrum currently in private hands, which would jeopardize billions worth of existing investment in infrastructure. Minister Tuelas told the media that government policy created the mobile operators, so they have no right to complain about changes in that policy. The only thing government did to create those operators, of course, was fail to recognize a massive opportunity and leave the market free to capitalize on it. It was too busy failing to get landlines to the poor. Or is it offshore? Oh, Thintana. Uh, well, th no, Thintana no longer exists. Uh, it disinvested from Telcom when, um, uh, when Telcom was listed. The majority ownership was the SPC Telecommunications of Texas. Who owns them? Right. Uh, I'm not sure who owns them, actually. I think they're privately owned in, in the States. So it's, an offshore it's, an offshore, it's an offshore entity, and the idea was that they would bring in investment and expertise in order to help Telcom develop its network. Uh, what they did is they brought in a lot of expertise to milk Telcom dry um, and didn't invest a whole lot, right, other than what it was legally obliged to do in terms of rolling out a million lines in underserviced areas, most of which have been disconnected. So it, it achieved very little. But it was, it, was a, it was a crony capitalist venture, basically. The government sold part of Telcom to a private investor from the States. So should we be concerned about um, data prices that are uh, out of bundle or used overseas? So it might be the case that a data bundle is reasonably priced. If you want two gigabytes of data, it's mm -hmm. like rand. But once you go out of bundle, it's two rand a megabyte. So it's 2,000 rand yes. um, for that yes. same product. Um, so there's a huge difference in price. If you go overseas, it's 150 rand a megabyte. So 150,000 rand for a gigabyte. Yeah. Now, if we are concerned about these sorts of prices, what kind of intervention will you recommend? Well, that might be a that might be a different uh, a different issue because I think there is a lot of sort of you could argue that there's false marketing going on there that that 
companies are being somewhat dishonest about it. Um, I mean, I've been caught by that as well, you know, buying a capped product um, and then finding that I went out of bundle, not being notified about it. And by the time I discover that I'm out of bundle a day later, I've racked up a thousand rands worth of, uh, worth of worth data costs. Right? And that, that, is, that is underhanded. And I'm fairly sure that, you know, regulatory intervention there, you know, would not, would not really be a problem, uh, even on the basis of, you know, pretty much free market principles. Right, because you're generally screwing the consumer. Um, they have been, in my experience, they have been getting somewhat better with notifying people in advance that they are about to run out of bundle. Uh, and there are also options to actually cap your product altogether, right, so that those charges won't be incurred. I'm not sure how universally they're applied, though. That would take quite a lot of research to figure out whether that is universally applied and if so, how many, cu how many customers are actually make, taking advantage of that? But yeah, that, that is a problem. The other, the other problem is things like data rollover, which uh, frankly has been declared under the Consumer Protection Act uh, to be illegal, uh, yet you still buy data for only 30 days. Under the Consumer Protection Act, it has to remain valid for at least six months. Uh, and in principle, once I buy the data off you, I'm sorry, it's mine to use, and it shouldn't expire at all. Uh, as, as far as I can see. So if Adam and Paul limited themselves to those sorts of issues, would be happy to support the movement? I'd be much, I'd be much happier to support the movement. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of sort of fairly dodgy practices that happen when you've got a limited cartel, you know, and you see that with the casinos, you know, when you've only got a limited number of casino licenses. Any sort of market where you have a limited number of licenses, um, which basically guarantees these people a duopoly or a, a what's the word for, for, for three players, an oligopoly. Um, you're going to end up with a whole lot of uh, less competition and a whole lot of practices which are sort of salient and they don't compete the, the, those, those practices out of the market. You know, in a much freer market, you might get new competitors who would look at this and say, listen, you know, we can give you a data product and we're not going to rip you off when you go out of bundle. Right? We can give you a data product and if you buy a gig from us, right, it'll remain valid for six months, right, whether or not, or, or, for, or, or forever whether or not you use it. Um, in the absence of that competition, um, you know, there, there are abuses by the cartel. But to argue that the cartel has been, you know, just rapacious and, and purely profit motivated and, uh, you know, rip customers off in general with their data prices, no, I think that goes too far. And I think the proof is in the pudding. The proof is <coughs> in the fact that we've got more cell phones in this country than we have people. Um, you know, 80, at least 80 percent and probably more of South Africans have access to a cell phone, um, unlike fixed lines. Yes, sir. Just following on and, uh, on on from that, um, I mean, effectively, we are seeing a situation where the market is not as competitive as it should be because of all of those behaviours that we are seeing. Correct. Um, imagine you could design policy, complete completely blank slate. Mm -hmm. What would that look like? I mean, would you limit um, spectrum ownership to a certain number of years um, up front, so when people buy it, they only buy it for 10 years and there's subsequent competition. Or, or what, what other mechanisms could there be? Well, I, could, I can't see a good reason to do that. You know, a, a lot of governments like that idea, and, and the government uh, in South Africa certainly likes that idea. That's what they did with mineral rights. They expropriated mineral rights. Um, they grandfathered in, fathered in existing mineral rights, but any new mineral rights are no longer, no longer belong to the landowner, right? and they will be leased from the state. Some countries uh, operate that way with land. Um, but if you take the land analogy, right, I can't see a good reason why the fact that land is scarce should be a reason why you shouldn't own it in perpetuity, right? or until someone offers you a better price. If you think you can make better use of my land than I am, and I'm willing to sell to you, then offer me a fair price and I'll, I'll sell. You know, and, and that, in almost all circumstances, um, you know, with a, f a, f a few issues are probably technically a bit difficult with highways and, you know, dams and so forth. But um, in almost all circumstances, the market is perfectly able to allocate uh, those resources fairly. Um, with Spectrum, we've for long had a, a situation where uh, there's certain unlicensed Spectrum. Right, where all the government says is, okay, you can operate to this. This is the, the ISM spectrum, uh, industrial, scientific, and medical. 
uh, Wi-Fi operates in those bands, for example. You don't need a license for Wi-Fi. The only thing is you're limited in the power you can, you can output, right? which basically means that you don't interfere too much with your neighbors uh, by running your garage remote control or your Wi-Fi your Wi-Fi router. So, you know, there's a lot of technology that actually happens in those bands. Right? So once you've got that, right, I can't see any good reason why the rest of that spectrum shouldn't be owned. Uh, and if big operators end up buying up all that spectrum and then leasing it out to people who want to sublet it, can't see why that is a problem either. And if you've got a better idea of how to use that spectrum, how to use it more efficiently, offer off the operator some money. If you can convince your bankers, I'm sure you'll get the loan. Just going back to the breaking the oligopoly or the, the poor market, poor competitiveness. Uh, any ideas? For a start, I would not limit the number of licenses in uh, in the market. You know, um, and I have this view about all licenses. Um, if the government wants to ha put certain restrictions on certain businesses for certain reasons, you know, you don't want to have a bottle store across from a school or whatever, fine. Put that in a license and say, as long as you qualify, right, then you can get a license. Right? But it doesn't limit the number of licenses. Right? It's not up to the government to determine how big the market is you know, and whether the market can carry more competitors. If you want to open a bottle store right next to another bottle store, that's between you and that guy. You know, it's, it's going to be who, who provides the best service. Um, and presumably one of them is going to close. Um, there's absolutely not a problem with that. And that's, a, that's the same principle should apply to, uh, to telecoms licenses. Right? If you can meet the basic requirements, then you should be able to get a license. Right? Whether or not you make a successful business out of it, it's entirely up to you and your investors. Yes, sir. Um, you benchmarked South African data prices against some other countries, but most mm -hmm. of those were developed, industrialized countries, yes. except for maybe India. I was just wondering <coughs> if you could point to a middle-income developing country that is on par with South Africa, that has well, I did, I did mention a bit more effectively and has a better regulatory framework that enables greater competition. Actually, there aren't many. Um, and frankly, I blame the ITU because a lot of a lot of people take their sort of policy frameworks from the International Telecommunications Union. Um, but if you want to put us in a in a sort of band, then in terms of affordability, Brazil and China are slightly better. Um, Chile is roughly the same, and Mexico and India is slightly worse than us in terms of affordability. Um, but you know, that's it's not a function of, of uh, it, it's not really a function of, of um, data costs so much. You know, it's, I mean, all the equipment is priced in dollars. Um, it's more of a, f a function of uh, inequality between incomes. And yeah, purchasing power parity. That's that's really well. That's what they tried to work out in this report. And that's what I say. In terms of purchasing power parity, uh, we're pretty much slap bang in the middle between India, Brazil, and China. I understand that New Zealand is one of the only, uh, I've got a second hand, so mm -hmm. it's one of the only, if not the only country in the world where the spectrum is totally privately owned. No licensing, in other words, you buy it and it's all, like, like free old property. Mm. I actually, Do you know they're not? I actually don't know. Okay, well, I mean, uh, speculating that that is true, mm -hmm. you would then think that, that the New Zealand uh, prices would be lower than elsewhere because there would be more certainty and so on and so forth. No, I suppose it could still be things like st the infrastructure and so on, but I mean, <coughs> what, would, what could be a reason why, if it were, I mean, in, a, in a country specu specu speculating, if a country did have freedom, uh, for a freehold of the spectrum, would you not suspect that there would be cheaper data there? Well, look, in terms of affordability in New Zealand, uh, the prices are cheaper. Um, in terms of absolute dollar prices, they're not. Um, now, remember that in a market, you know, Price has very little, if anything, to do with cost. Right? The only real relation between price and cost is that if your price is lower than your cost, you're going to lose money. Um, what I'm prepared to pay for a product right, is where the market should price it at. Right? And I was, I was thinking the other day about advertising. You know, if you have four advertising uh, billboards and you need to sell them to the market and you've got 10 people that are interested, well, you're not going to sell them at the lowest price that those 10 are going, to, are going to be prepared to offer. You're going to sell them to the four people who are prepared to pay you the most. Right? And that then gives you incentive to put up more billboards, 
suppose you can also accommodate the other 10 um, and and make the most efficient use of your of your limited of your scarce resource right? and I think it's the same in, in uh, with the privately owned spectrum yeah prices will be as high as the market will bear you know that's how that's how the market works and if you think it's too high or if anyone in New Zealand thinks it's too high then they're absolutely free to come and compete absolutely free to buy that spectrum and uh, and compete and try and offer lower prices if they feel that works then the other aspect of course is not just the spectrum but the infrastructure that you have to put down i mean south yes. africa i think they gave them part of the reason for the monopoly was because of that cost <coughs> are there places where a, one company owns the infrastructure and the others uh, use it uh yes there are places like that um i wouldn't be confident to name them off the top of my head but yes, local loop unbundling has been done, um, but I haven't really seen any case studies that say it's been this great success uh, anywhere. And that probably goes back to sort of the old the old line that you know says, "What is more expensive, one railway line between Joburg and Cape Town, or two? Well, if you're the government, you'd say two lo two railway lines are more expensive because you're doubling up in your infrastructure. But if you're if you're a customer two railway lines works out cheaper for you because there's going to be price, price, price competition uh, for your business. So th the correct answer is that two railway lines between Joburg and Cape Town is cheaper, is better for consumers than one. Um, and that's a principle that I think the government has never really understood. They always have a problem with duplicating infrastructure because they feel that this is somehow wasted capital investment. But it isn't. It makes things better for consumers, and that's the whole purpose of capitalism, after all. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, my question is: It so happens that, and Thomas Sowell has written about this, that if prices are skyrocketing or going up, mm -hmm. in many cases, government has to do with that, right? For example, around housing as well. Mm -hmm. He's written his book, um, the housing boom and bust, that. The whole regulations had to do with pushing up prices and land and all that, yes. and housing prices. So um, my question is, is it wrong to say that data must fall, to, uh, to say that data must fall, but it must fall in the way that government needs to get out of the market, because government <coughs> is making the price higher. Do you think that argument is right, instead of just saying, instead of just opposing you, data you, must fall, you can't would that work? I don't think you can generalize about that. You know, yes, in some cases, government absolutely is involved in, in, in or is the cause of higher prices. Uh, but in many cases, it's just the market at work, you know, supply and demand at work. Right? If, there's, if there's an undersupply for whatever reason and there's, and there's high demand, then prices are going to rise. And that's exactly what you want the market to do. Right? Um, I don't know who's, who's, who wrote this, the great line that said the solution to high prices is high prices. Right? And the reason is because that attracts uh, that attracts competition, right? and it signals to the the incumbents in the market that you know there's money to be made in investing more in infrastructure and imp improving your supply, right? or finding alternative supplies if that's you know if that's an option. Um, so you know it's 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 hard to generalize about prices in that way, and I think that's pr that's part of the problem with movements like data must fall. They look at price as a simple thing that the government can control, you know, or that or that, that prices are right or wrong somehow. Um, and the thing is, you can't say whether a price is right or wrong. Nobody has enough knowledge to say whether the price is right or wrong. Price just is, you know. It's it's that's why in, in financial markets they'll talk about price discovery. You know, nobody knows what the price should be. It's a sort of collective process to discover what the price should be in the process of, of individual transactions and so on. Right? So I offer you something, if you're too eager to buy it, then next time I'll charge you a bit more. Right? Until you won't buy it anymore and then I realize that I've, I've gone too high. But that's the only sense in which you can say that a price is too high. You can't really look at a price and say, well, you know, it's too high or it's too low. So, so there's a philosophical problem with movements like, the, like data must fall in, in that perspective. But yeah, from an economic perspective, absolutely, the government should get out of the way. Any regulation is likely to to be worse in terms of either quality uh, or price. If a, if a regulation does work to bring prices down, what tends to happen is that you get um, you get shortages, right, and you end up you end up having to get rationed, right, and ultimately you end up with companies like Eskom, right, 
who are among the very few companies in the world that say, please buy less of our product. Yeah. Um, that's what government-owned enterprises do. They want you to buy less of their product because, because they keep prices artificially low. Yes, sir. A uh, question, if you would comment on it, is the a couple of municipalities around the country have been giving free Wi-Fi in certain areas. Mm -hmm. Can you just comment on that? Well, uh, when I'm I, I think it's quite a positive thing. Yeah, well, to an extent. Um, it's, it's a great idea in principle, uh, and if they can afford it, right, then fine. But the thing is, they're going to have to pay for a lot of rates and taxes. Um, when I was looking to move out of Joburg uh, in 2008, 2009, uh, I chose to move to Neisner. Right? Now, one of the things that made Neisner famous in the preceding few years was free Wi-Fi. Right? That was all over town. Right? It sounded great. I mean, you know, I was a technology journalist, and I need the internet access if I'm going to work from Neisner. So, wonderful, free, free Wi-Fi access. By the time I got there, they'd limited it to 45 minutes a day per person. Right? Well, you know, that's what happens with free stuff. Right? You end up having to ration it. You know, someone has to pay for it. Right? And if you can't pay for it out of, out of rates and taxes, then you're going to have to ration it. Uh, and the reason you can't pay for it out of rates and taxes is not because there aren't enough rich people in Eisner. I mean, you know, half Eisner is stinking rich. You know, it's all foreigners and Joburgers who commute and people who live in Pazula and Samola. You know, they're much wealthier than the people who actually live and work in Eisner. But, um, the problem is uh, this sort of uh, you know, free services get abused. Right? You're going to get people like me sitting there right, downloading hundreds of gigabytes a month just because I can, because it's free. Right? And I'm not going to be the only one that does that. So you end up with a very disproportionate allocation of, of the service. So in practice, I don't think, I don't hold up much hope that it will work for, for many companies, oh, sorry, for, for many municipalities. Um, I have more hope with companies, uh, things like um, coffee shops and so on, that offer free Wi-Fi. Because they do it on a basis that, that A, it's capped. Right? So my local pub, for example, if you get there after the 20th of the month, you're going to get a big sign from Telcom on your phone saying that he's capped. Um, but B, there's a good reason for to offer free Wi-Fi. Right? Because I can go there and drink beer while I work. You know? So he's, he's, they've got a financial incentive. And that's, that works out a lot better. So I have far more hope in private companies actually offering free Wi-Fi than in uh, municipalities. Yes. Another question. Uh, I'm just asking you, in terms of the poor, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, the poor, many people argue that the poor people, they find these <coughs> data expensive and all that. Mm -hmm. Do you think is there a way government could intervene to some form of assisting the poor in some way? So they're able to to use data and they can access, you know, internet and all that. Is there forms of assistance they could get from government? Um, I suppose they could. Um, yes, you could always argue that subsidies or, you know, some or other regulation that, uh, you know, is means tested could be implemented. Um, I think the cost of implementing something like that would be prohibitive. Um, you know, I mean, how do you define poor? Right? Is it someone who doesn't pay tax? Well, now already you've covered 90% of South Africa. Um, you know, and now what are you going to do? Are you going to offer them uncapped data? Are you going to offer them capped data and then say they've got to pay for the rest? Um, how are you going to measure that? You know, it's, it's a really complicated thing to, to try and do. Um, private, com private companies, look, uh, pr the private companies have already uh, offered sort of limited data offerings, um, you know, to, to people on prepaid and so on. So, right, you get this with access to Facebook or with access to Wikipedia or, you know, sort of limit, limited um, and, and, and throttled access. And I think that might, be a better, that might be a better way to get data to the poor. Um, I think it might also, you know, if, if, if you let the market develop, I think people like the banks are probably very interested in, you know, ha having people with access to data. You know, for banks, it's much cheaper to deal with me when I use my mobile app right, than it is for to deal with me over the phone or to deal with me when I go into a branch. Right? So they've got a perfectly good reason to make sure that I have access to the Internet, which is why my bank, in fact, offers me cell phones and, 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 and Internet services. Right? Um, so I, 
I suspect that if the market was a, a, a little bit more free, that companies like banks and perhaps retailers, uh, anyone else who does business with the poor, and that's, there's a lot of people, um, would find a way to actually work with mobile operators to get to get more services to the poor. But frankly, so far they've done a considerably better job than the government ever has. You know, the whole idea of telecom was to provide subsidized services to the poor. Didn't work. Spectrum. Yeah. Is there a case to be made with uh, all the research you've done? I'm a bit late, so I may, you, may, you may have mentioned this. That uh, going that way is going to be detrimental. I mean, other, other than simple, well, based on principles, one would think so. But could you show, show case study after case study that it would be much better if one had uh, either privatized spectrum or bought, li bought spectrum on the basis of license? than if the government nationalized it? Well, I haven't looked at specific case studies, but I, you know, I do recall sitting in a conference uh, a few years ago where government was talking about issuing um, uh, some spectrum to the mobile operators. And the mobile operators basically argued that, listen, you're giving us too little. And by too little, they meant too little bandwidth. Uh, and the reason was because the, the, the bureaucrats had no idea what new technology looked like what 4G and so on looked like, and how much sort of bandwidth it needed to the spectrum. So they were doling out, I, I can't remember, it was, I think it was 20 megahertz slots, when the guys needed 30 megahertz slots, um, simply to make the technology work. And they said, you know, these smaller slots, you can do with them what you like, but we don't need them. Um, you know, so from, from that perspective, there's a lot of, uh, certainly a lot of anecdotal evidence that says that allocating this on the basis of what a government bureaucrat thinks is necessary um, is a very bad way to go about it. You know, if you want innovation, um, you know, you want you want the innovation to be connected to the labs where they develop the stuff. You know, you don't want the government, with hindsight, to say, okay, well, you know, this is this is what we're going to do, or this is what we should have done two years ago. We'll do it now. Um, it'll it'll significantly slow down innovation. But yeah, from a yeah from an economic policy point of view, you know, I think I think. It would pr probably be, in fact, it's something I'm, I'm quite keen to do, actually, is to look at some case studies uh, and see where Spectrum has been nationalized and what the outcome has been. Yes, sir? Can I make a point about, um, we keep talking about government has to own the Spectrum and, and sell it, but um, I read an interesting case about uh, in, in America when they first started with radio transmissions, mm -hmm. completely unregulated, yes. and local stations would broadcast in a certain area, if you wanted to broadcast something else, you wouldn't broadcast in the same frequency, yeah. and you would broadcast it to you know, a reasonable distance away. And so the free market found a way to you know to deal with that. And if someone broadcast over your frequency, you took them to court. Yes. And the legal process, normal property rights, could deal with infringement uh, like that. I think you misunderstand me. I don't think the government should own spectrum. Yes. I think the good thing is government does own spectrum, right? And it needs to be sold. It needs to be privatized. Uh, yeah, I guess just making the point that government isn't necessary at all in this whole process. Government isn't necessary at all. No, no, you're quite right. You know, in the same way that government isn't necessary in, in, in controlling who owns land. Yes. You know, um, in fact, you can make an argument that zoning restrictions are, are superfluous. You know, um, if if you know there would be private sector ways to actually deal with zoning issues uh, other than uh, government regulation. So no, they 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 certainly historically they. There's no real reason to believe that government should be involved in this at all. Can I give you a useless piece of information? Mm -hmm. Houston doesn't have any of zoning regulations. Houston, Texas. That seems to be doing quite well for itself. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think I think it's I think it's perfectly reasonable. You know. Um, I mean there'd be a whole lot of private private sector sort of mechanisms that would develop. Uh, in the absence of zoning regulations, of course, you know. I mean, how would you how would you oppose certain developments that you don't like in your residential area? Um, you know, you'd have to get together with other people and sue. Um, but there's absolutely perfectly the perfectly good free market uh, remedies in civil law to deal with issues like that, and the same is true for spectrum. Uh, if I may ask a follow-up question, please. Yeah. Question of infrastructure sharing. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if, we, if we take your example of that train line between Durban and Johannesburg, imagine government were to wake up tomorrow morning and say, we've, we've listened to Evo, we'll liberalize the transport market, anybody can open a train commuter service or freight service. Mm -hmm. um, in that case, surely nobody would bother to actually build a new line just because it's too expensive. Nobody would actually compete with Transnet because Transnet has a completely depreciated asset. So from that perspective, isn't there actually an argument to be made for forced infra infrastructure service? Well, I mean, a if I can quickly finish, um, loop, closing the loop back to, uh, to telecom. Um, I, if I think of a market like Zimbabwe where you've got one operator which is very large has, yeah. has market share of 65% of mm -hmm. um, they have an incredibly large infrastructure based towers and government is arguing for forced infrastructure uh, sharing yeah. just in order to make the admittedly standard state owned telco companies which are hopelessly underperforming be able to compete on price yeah. because of the fixed cost element um, that's an argument that's made often about infrastructure um, you know, public transport uses that, you know, that's why I use the train example. Public transport uses the same sort of arguments. Um, but to, to, to go to your train example, A, neither you or I are in a position to decide who would or wouldn't want to build that second railway line. You know, who, wouldn't get, who would get into the market. You know, you'd have to be a smart business operator. You'd have to understand the market. You'd have to understand where the customers are. Um, perhaps you have other businesses that might use it. Um, if you look at railway lines, for example, uh, ISCO has developed uh, or has r basically refurbished the Session Saldana line right, at its own expense, right, for the simple reason that you know, South African Railways wasn't or Transnet wasn't going to get to it. Right. So they invested billions into upgrading that line, even though they don't own it. Right. There's a similar thing with uh, li railway line to um, Richards Bay, the coal terminal there. Right which is being upgraded, not at Transnet's expense, right, by customers, simply because they need to, they really need to get this stuff on, on rail. You know, um, I mean, this guy I spoke to about it said, it's t if you put about 22 road trucks into a single railway car, you know, so can you imagine the cost of moving all of that coal by road, which is what they're doing. You know, it's actually quite insane. So there's a lot of people that have trucks on the road today Right, that would be absolutely happy with a rail service that actually works. Um, I cannot see why, if if this is opened up to the market, right, and if these licenses were available, why someone wouldn't invest in that. I think your biggest, your, your perhaps your biggest hurdle there would be the private ownership of land alongside railway lines. Where do you get your right of way? You know, and you'd have to you'd have to buy out a whole lot of land. So in the case of Transnet, they, th there's no need for fixed cost digression because there is no fixed cost. Yeah, but there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of other businesses with huge fixed costs, right? That private companies do. Private companies engage in all the time. You know, you want to get into shipbuilding, you, 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 your fixed costs are insane, right? But once you're churning out a ship every six weeks, right, you, you're doing quite well for yourself. You make your money back in ten or twenty years, but investors look at that and they, you know, they, 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 they consider that sort of timeline. You know, I don't. I don't see the notion that oh, if you can't make your money back in 20 years, then private sector won't be interested. Um, you know, there are ways and means of funding that, and the market has become very sophisticated in in funding uh, big infrastructure projects, assuming that they know that they can own those assets, right, and 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 remain owners of those assets. Of course, if there's a risk of nationalising those assets, then you've got a problem. Then people aren't going to invest. Yes, ma'am. So, someone who doesn't know the field at all, what, what is the quality of know how in the department? I mean, we've always had the impression that certainly the, f the previous ministers of communication have been appalling. Yeah, and uh, no, I think it remains. Look, I'm not, I'm not a day to day reporter in telecoms anymore, you know, so I don't, I don't follow them that closely anymore. Um, Duncan McLeod, who I mentioned earlier, you know, he, he still looks at it very closely. But the impression I get, uh, certainly from reading people like him, is that it hasn't really improved much, um, and and that's that's but that's true for most government departments. You know, it's <coughs> there's there's a real lack of capacity and lack of understanding when you're not in an industry yourself. You know, um, which is to my mind one of the reasons. And you know, I'm not saying this about South Africa's government in particular. You know, it's not it's not only South Africa's government. This is government in general, the world over. 
um, has a very limited and hands-off knowledge and understanding of the indus industries that they regulate, um, which is one of the reasons that I would like to see a lot less regulation rather than more. Might they in fact be regulating partly because the lack of knowledge and the, the, the sort of, as you say, the hands-off knowledge, it, it's a sort of almost, an, it, never mind the other uh, ramifications, but it's almost an insecurity that if you hang on to it because you don't really understand the market, how, how, the, how the industry works. Yeah, they consider it a risk mm. to, to open up the market right, and to take what they think are strategic assets um, and, and turn them over to market forces, which they fundamentally distrust. Um, and there's a lot of ideological uh, sort of distrust of the market there as well. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of that, you know, that they don't really understand how the market works and how, how, how these companies work. And as soon as they see, you know, profit motive and they see big profits being made, their first thought is windfall taxes. So we didn't mean to let you make that much profit. Right, is that it? Thanks very much. Oh. A very insightful talk. Thank you very much, Eustace. Thanks for inviting me. Mm. Thank you.